Thanks, buddy. You may recall an incident that happened back in December of 2008. It was during a press conference in Baghdad. President George W. Bush was up on the, the, the podium up front, and all of a sudden, not one, but two shoes come flying through the air directly at his head. You remember this? Yes. Now, the president, to his credit, he, he ducked and he, he dodged both of, both of these shoes. Now, the Iraqi reporter who threw the shoes knew what he was doing. He didn't throw a book. He didn't throw a chair. He threw shoes. Why? Well, because unlike in our American culture, we have, we have a fascination with shoes. In, in the Middle Eastern culture, to, of course, hit somebody with your shoe or throw a shoe or even to show the bottom of your shoe to someone is a grave insult or an attack upon their person. Now, you might be asking yourself, I love shoes, so what's the big deal about shoes? Well, look down at those things on your feet. I mean, we call them shoes, but you could also call them the sponge of all things unclean. I mean, you walk down the sidewalk or the city street out there, and they're going to sponge up particles of dirt and dead insects and other things. You walk into a restaurant, and your shoes are going to pick up the cleaning products on the floor and food particles. You go into a public restroom, and they're going to pick up whatever those things are in restrooms. <laughs> so you might think of your shoes as kind of a dirty documentary of all the places that you've been. And that helps us to understand why, if you read Leviticus, as you all do every day, <laughs> and you read about the vestments of the priest, you'll notice that everything from their headwear to their underwear is included, but there's not a single syllable about their shoes. It also explains why the writers writing in the Talmud, when they described what was happening at the temple, said that there was employed there the ancient version of a podiatrist. Why? Because when the priests showed up to work, they took off their shoes. Because the place where they ministered was holy ground. No shoes around the altar, no shoes in the holy place, certainly no shoes in the holy of holies. And of course, this was but an imitation of what happened to Moses at the burning bush and Joshua outside the city of Jericho, where the messenger of Yahweh showed up and said, don't come any closer, take off your shoes, because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now, why all this talk about shoes? Well, it's to prepare us for thinking in a new and an ancient way about where we take our shoes off. A new and ancient way of thinking about holiness and sanctification. Now, it's new because, granted, most Christians today, when they think about sanctification, think in terms of good works, fruit of the Spirit, holiness of life and conduct. But it's ancient because, as I will argue, the lion's share of Bible talk about sanctification and holiness is not really about what you do or what you don't do, but about where you take your shoes off. The lion's share of talk about holiness is about being in the presence of the holy, holy, holy God who does what? Holies sanctifies us. So you might put it this way. Sanctification is more about your zip code, where you are, than about a code of conduct. Now, to get us to kind of thinking about this, there's a couple of lines from Psalm 24 that are going to guide us through this discussion. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who may go up to this holy spot on the mountain, and who may take off his shoes and stand in the presence of the holy God? Let's work our way toward an answer by hitchhiking our way through the Old Testament in the shotgun seat of patriarchs and prophets. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that in the ancient Near East, there were a lot of places that were thought to be holy by nature. I mean, they just were holy. Holy groves and holy rivers and holy mountains. Now, in the Bible, that ain't going to fly. 
If a place is holy, it's only because God has theophanied himself there. He has appeared there. And because God is there, that place is holy. And that also means that if God leaves, it's automatically unsanctified. No God there, no holiness there. It's like when God leaves, all the sanctity is vacuumed up and packaged and taken with him. No exceptions. So in the Bible, the first place that is made holy because the holy God is there is, of course, Eden, which Ezekiel calls the holy mountain of God. And the first man and woman who are able to ascend the hill of the Lord and to stand in his holy place are, of course, our mom and dad, priest Adam and priest Eve. This was the place, by the way, where God walked about among them. In fact, in Hebrew, and I know you were all waiting for the Hebrew. In Hebrew, when, you, when God walks about, that same Hebrew form is used to describe how he walked in the garden, and then how he walked in the camp of Israel in the tabernacle, and then how he walked all those years waiting for the temple to come. So Adam and Eve were there, but of course, pretty soon, as Scott talked about this morning, they were booted out. They had to be de-Edenized, and when they were de-Edenized, they were also de-templed. No longer could they ascend the hill of the Lord or stand in his holy place. Now, what's fascinating is what happens after that. All of human history, from Genesis 3 onward, is basically sinful humanity's attempts through, whether it's political movements or social movements or moral movements or humanly devised religions, whatever it might be, humanity is attempting to create their own little Edens divorced from God. In other words, to have a holy place without the holy God being there. And the greatest example of this is Babel. Now, when I was a kid, Growing up in Sunday school, my, my impression of the Tower of Babel story is basically this. You had a whole bunch of bad people who were too big for their britches, who decided they'd build the world's first skyscraper until, of course, God pulled the plug on the whole project by mixing up their languages. Well, that's not quite it. So this tower was probably what in the ancient world was called a ziggurat. And a ziggurat is basically a man-made mountain. They're scattered still throughout Mesopotamia. And there'd be a stairway that went from earth to heaven. Heaven was the very top, the, the peak of this mountain where there would be a shrine. So that's probably what they were going about. That's what they were trying to do. And why did they want to do it? Two reasons. They didn't want to be scattered. They want to have unity. And they wanted to make a name for themselves. Now, in ancient parlance, to, to make a name for yourself basically meant that you were achieving some sort of immortality. Kind of the same thing happens today when people will build a monument or a big building and they'll put their name on it. It's their way of achieving some sort of immortality. Well, of course, this was never going to work, but this was, the, this was their attempt at a replacement of Mount Eden, except this was devised by themselves, dreamt up by themselves, made by themselves. They were striving for sanctification, we might say, apart from the holy gifting of God. And it was doomed to fail. These fallen Adams and Eves could not ascend their own man-made mountain. They couldn't stand in their own man-made pseudo-holy place because God instituted the anti-Pentecost. The unity they wanted became disunity through their disunification of speech. And they wanted to make a name for themselves. And they did. It's just not the one they wanted. <laughs> the place was named Babel, which is a pun off the Hebrew verb balal, which means to confuse. And you know in Revelation, Babylon becomes a symbol of what? Babylon is the icon of everything which is unholy unsanctified. It's whore Babylon, which tries to seduce the world into its own version of uncleanness. So you have Adam and Eve booted out of the temple of Eden, 
you have the descendants of Adam and Eve trying to create their own little Eden, which is doomed to fail. But here's where things get very interesting. You see, the very things that these tower builders wanted, God was ready and willing to give. But in his own time, and in his own way, and to his own man. That man was Jacob. And that time was generations later. And the way that God did this is through that nighttime vision that God gave to Jacob of the ladder or the stairway extending from earth to heaven. So you remember, he sees this sulam in Hebrew, this set of steps that goes from where? The earth to heaven, the very place that the tower builders wanted to reach. And there's, of course, the angels of God ascending and descending upon their stairway, and there's Yahweh who's appearing, and he's speaking to Jacob. In this vision, God gives to Jacob the very things that the tower builders were selfishly and sinfully grasping for themselves. They wanted a ziggurat with a stairway from earth to heaven. That's exactly what God shows to Jacob in this vision. They wanted unity. And God says to Jacob, your descendants will be all over the place, but they're going to be un unified, made one in the blessing that is going to come from your seed, the Messiah. And, now this is fascinating, they wanted to make a name for themselves. Well, you remember what Jacob says when he wakes up? He says, he says how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Well, Babylon actually means the gate of God. And so Jacob is saying, this is the gate of God. This is the doorway to heaven, what God has just shown to me. Now, what's happening in this vision that God gives to Jacob is God is basically saying, look, I know that humanity has gone and screwed up everything. They have spread their, their cancerous unholiness everywhere. But I'm going to make sure there's one spot in creation where I can be with my people, where there's going to be cherubim and seraphim, where I can live among them, and angels can be there, and my people can appear before me, and I can make them the way that I want them to be. I can sanctify them. Now, God is going to do this, but it's not in Jacob's lifetime. It's not in the lifetime of his children or grandchildren. God is going to fulfill what he promised to Jacob at the foot of Mount Sinai when he gives the instructions to Moses about how to build the tabernacle. Let's make sure that we all understand what the tabernacle was all about. It functioned for several different reasons. I mean, it was the place, of course, where sacrifices were brought. The tabernacle was the place where the psalms were sung. It's where the lepers could appear to be pronounced clean. It's where the priests would pray for the nation of Israel inside the holy place. The tabernacle served all those purposes. But if there's one overarching purpose of the tabernacle, one that kind of pulls into its orbit all these other reasons, it's this. This tent was the one place in the world where the holy God dwelt on earth in order that he might make his people as he is, holy. That's the purpose of the tabernacle. And I would argue if you get that, you understand the incarnation of Jesus, you understand the ministry of Jesus, the purpose of the church, and you also understand how you too have received the free gift of sanctification. So let's unpack all that. First of all, keep in mind that Yahweh was not the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek god Zeus. And you know Zeus, <laughs> very interesting character. If he wasn't hooking up with, with human women and, and fathering children with them, he was just kind of cooling his heels on Mount Olympus, just kind of standing aloof from humanity. Well, that's not going to work with Yahweh. Where does Yahweh want to be? He wants to be right in the middle of where his people are. He wants to literally move into their neighborhood. He, he wants, God wants to make sure that if you were to ask any Israelite, where's your God? The Israelite could turn and point at the tabernacle and say, right there. That's where my God is. That's his zip code. That's his address. 
That's where he's placed himself for us. And because they knew that this was God's zip code, this was God's address, they also knew that this is where their Eden was, or their new Eden, if you, if you want. Because you went up, when you went up to the tabernacle, you were in a garden paradise. There were images of lions and, and oxen and cherubim and, and flowers and open gourds. And in fact, what did you have at the Garden of Eden? You had two cherubim with the flaming swords guarding the paradise. And what do you have at the tabernacle? You have two cherubim who are guarding the mercy seat, the place of atonement. So here was the house of God. Here was the gate of heaven. Here is where you had angels ascending and descending. Here is where God chose to dwell in the midst of his people. And because the Israelites knew that, they knew that the closer they were to where God was, the holier they became. Now, that's a crucial point, so let's just kind of pause here to think about that for a minute, because this is, this is very different from the way that most people think about holiness and sanctification today. So holiness is far too often imagined today to be kind of, it's kind of a spiritual commodity that can be obtained in greater quantities if you're willing to put forth the effort to obtain it. I was going to call this gold's gem theology of sanctification, <laughs> but after Kelsey's video, I've renamed it the God Squad theology of sanctification. Don't worry, we are not going to show that clip again. Let's say you want, you know, a narrower waist and, and, and bigger biceps and tighter glutes and all those things. Well, you know what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to you skip the pecan pie, which is like a, a no-go for me. Skip the, you got to eat kale. You got to do your squats and lunges and you got to do your cardio. You lift your weights and you're going to have a chance, maybe, at least theoretically, of obtaining that perfect beach body that you want. Well, it's kind of like that. That's where the thinking goes about, about this holiness as a commodity, that if you want to lead a sanctified life, well, then you got to bypass a life of pleasure. you got to diligently read your devotional every day, preferably unveiling mercy. <clears throat> Thank you. you got to read through your Bible every year. you got to pray, fast, give to the poor, you got to help little old ladies load their groceries in their, into their trunk. <laughs> Basically, you got to lead the kind of life that only Daniel Emery Price leads. <laughs> Otherwise, what's going to happen? Your sanctity is going to grow stagnant, and your holiness muscles are going to atrophy. Now, i got to say this, because if I don't, I will be sure to be misquoted <laughs> and misunderstood. All those things I just talked about, reading your Bible, Praying, fasting, going to church, going to midweek services, helping little old ladies. All these things are wonderful, good, godly things to do, and I urge you to do them all. But never think that sanctification is going to be kind of a spiritual commodity that you can obtain by doing these good things. And this is where the Old Testament becomes so incredibly important and helpful to us. So I said a few minutes ago, Israel knew the closer they were to the presence of God in the sanctuary, the more holy they became. It was real simple. This is how it worked. You had, you had spheres or concentric circles of holiness. In the middle was the alpha holy spot, the holy of holies. Why was it holy? Because that's where God had placed himself. Now, if you step back a few paces into the next room, you're only in the holy place. You step a little farther, you're by the altar, it's less holy. Step back farther to the edge of Jerusalem, it's not as holy. So the closer you are to this epicenter of sanctification, the holier things become. It's even reflected in the metals that were used. What's all inside the Holy of Holies? Gold. What's the altar of burnt offering made out of? Bronze. And the vestments of the priest were the same. The vestments of the high priest, top quality material, top workmanship, because he got closer to the Holy of Holies. But the vestments of the regular priest, not so much so. They were just average. So everybody knew 
that the sanctuary was kind of like a mountain. You have the peak, that's the Holy of Holies, highest altitude, highest holiness. But the farther down you go, the lower the altitude, the lower the holiness. Now, don't miss a crucial point here. All the things that were holy there, the holy priest, the holy vestments, the holy sacrifices, the holy altar, the holy people, all of these were holy, not by nature, but by gift. Now, strawberries are by nature sweet, right? Ice is by nature cold. 80s music is by far, by nature, the best music, right? <laughs> Everybody knows this. Thank you. It's the loudest clap I've ever received for anything I've ever said. <laughs> but all these holy things in the tabernacle were holy in an alien, borrowed sort of way. They had a borrowed sanctity. They had an alien sanctification. They had, as it were, caught holiness because they were so close to the source. Just like the bread of the presence was close to the presence of God, and so it was considered most holy. And when the priest consumed this, they had edible sanctification. They ate holiness. It became a part of them because it was in the proximity of, in the presence of the holy God. Now, I want to make the jump to the New Testament, but gotta, i got to pause here just for a second because I know what some of you are thinking. It's not only Jesus who can read minds. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Chad, several times in Leviticus, I know that it says, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So how can you talk about holiness being a gift? Be holy. Be holy does not mean the same as be moral or be on your best behavior. God follows that up by saying, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am the one who sanctifies you. So it'd be kind of like a father saying to his child, be my son. You're already part of the family. I've made you that way. So be who you are. Don't pretend to be somebody that you're not. So be holy does not imply self-sanctification. You could no more make yourself holy than you, than you can make the sunshine. Now you can bask in the light and the warmth of the sun, just like you bask in the holiness and the sanctification of Christ. He sanctifies. We are those who are sanctified. Now I want to cross the bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And as I do, I want us to use our friend Aaron as a way to do that. So Aaron partially answered those questions, who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Because Aaron was a sort of new Adam. Because only Aaron as a high priest could go into the very heart of the garden sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, of course, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There he would enter with blood, the blood of sacrifice to sprinkle on the mercy seat. So Aaron, partially at least, was an answer to that question. But let me tell you, even on the best day of atonement that ever happened in the Old Testament, when the sun was shining and the sky was blue and all the Israelites were clad in sackcloth and ashes and they were down on their knees and they were confessing and repenting and lamenting, and Aaron carried out with ritual exactitude Everything required on the Day of Atonement, everything was done to Torah perfection. Even on that very best Day of Atonement, Aaron could not step out of the sanctuary and lift up his hands and cry out to the assembled worshipers, to tell us die. Because it was never finished. Because every year there was a new boatload of sins that had to be atoned for. Every year, the ritual had to be gone through again because Aaron was part of a divinely designed system of purification that was meant to be, designed to be incomplete, imperfect, insufficient to provide the atonement that was needed. And that is what makes the coming of Christ and the arrival of our embodied sanctification so crucial and so important for us to understand how we receive the gift of holiness. 
Just think about the work of Christ in connection briefly with three New Testament accounts. Number one, John chapter one. Nathanael has come to Jesus and he's confessed that he is the king of Israel. He's the son of God. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, oh, Nathanael, so you believe that I'm the Messiah because I said I saw you under the fig tree. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You know, back in Jacob's vision, when he saw the angels ascending and descending upon that ancient ziggurat, and Yahweh was there appearing and speaking words of promise and unity and blessing, well, guess what, Nathaniel? I am that ziggurat. I am the place where earth is joined to heaven and heaven is joined to earth in me. Because I am the word made flesh who tabernacles among you. And my body is the temple that will be torn down in crucifixion and raised up in resurrection. I am Yahweh appearing to you right now so that to be with me, Nathaniel, is to be in the presence of the holy, holy, holy God who sanctifies you. In other words, Nathaniel, sanctification. It's all about proximity to me. And then skip forward a few chapters in the Gospel of John to when Jesus has that dialogue with the woman at the well. After they kind of, you know, talk through her relationship issues. <laughs> the Samaritan woman says, well, you know, you Jews say we should worship on the mountain in Jerusalem, and we Samaritans say that we should worship on, on our mountain. So which is it? And Jesus says, well, <laughs> the hour is coming. In fact, it's here. When the worshipers of the Father are no longer going to worship on your mountain or my fellow Jews' mountain, but they're going to worship in capital S, Spirit, and in capital T, Truth. Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Spirit testifies of me. So people will worship not on your, your temple mount in Jerusalem and not on your Samaritan mountain. They're going to worship at me. Because I am Yahweh come down to earth. And so to be in my presence is to be in the presence of holiness. I'm the one who sanctifies you. And then finally go to the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews, we finally do have an answer to that question of Psalm 24. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Well, it certainly wasn't Aaron or any of the high priests. Because the psalm goes on to say, who? Who? the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. Well, that's not Aaron. Remember the whole golden calf incident? It's not any of the kings of Israel, not even David, as Dan pointed out last night. No clean hands there. But there is one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Clean hands on Jesus? Yes. Pure heart in Jesus? Yes. One who's not lifted up his soul to falsehood or sworn deceitfully? Yes. And when this one comes, he goes up to the hill of the Lord, not in Jerusalem, but into the heavenly Jerusalem. And he appears there, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own crucifixion blood. He goes into the presence of the Father with the blood that he shed on our behalf, on that ultimate day of atonement. And then Hebrews says this, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then this, by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Well, there you have it. That's where the story of salvation has been taking us all along. What we lost in Eden what the stupid tower builders thought that they could achieve on their own, what God promised to Jacob in a vision and what became reality in the, tab in the tabernacle and later the temple, that has now come to us. God has moved into the neighborhood and he's present as a flesh and blood man in Jesus Christ. So what we lost in Eden, we have now regained in Christ. Paradise lost is paradise regained in him. You may know, in fact, Dan mentioned this last night, that uh, back in February, my wife and I 
went to Israel with a church group from the Advent in Birmingham. It was a fantastic trip. We, uh, we went to the Sea of Galilee, and we saw where Jesus had worked his miracles of the multiplication of loaves. We saw the Sea of Galilee where he had stilled the storm. We went our way down to the Dead Sea, floated in the Dead Sea, visited Qumran. Then we went to Jerusalem. We went to, went to Bethlehem. We got to sing some Christmas hymns in the crypt under the Church of the Nativity. And we went to the, the temple steps, the very huge stone steps that lead up to where the temple was on Mount Moriah. It was an unforgettable trip, just full of all sorts of amazing memories because this was the place where Christ had accomplished our salvation. But there's one thing that I never forgot the whole time, and this is, uh, this is not very popular with travel agencies, <laughs> but we did not visit the Holy Land. We visited the land that had been holy, in fact, the land that had been holy for a long time, but we did not visit the Holy Land. But when we got home, and Sunday morning rolled around, and we drove from New Braunfels, Texas, into San Antonio, Texas, and we stepped inside the doors of our congregation, we visited the Holy Land. Because there, to borrow the language of Hebrews once more, as we gathered with the body of Christ in that place, we came to Mount Zion in the city of the living God. We came to the heavenly Jerusalem on earth. We came to innumerable angels in festival gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We came to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. We came to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. In Christ, we too ascended the hill of the Lord and stood in his holy place. And we didn't, but we could have taken off our shoes <laughs> because the place where we stood was holy ground. It was holy ground because here the holy God was present to sanctify us by speaking to us his holy words of grace and mercy and forgiveness. It was holy because here the holy God used the holy water of baptism to wash and sanctify his people. It was here because we gathered around the table that had the new and the better bread of the presence, the body of Christ, which sanctifies us in this edible sanctification. In this place, we stood on holy ground because the Lord was there right among us to sanctify us, to make us as he is. Holiness. It's more about your zip code where you are than about a code of conduct or a code of behavior. So, my friends, be holy. In other words, stick close to Jesus. Thank you.